please stay right where you are because it's time for GeorgiaCarry.org radio with Doug and Jesse King. GeorgiaCarry.org is Georgia's no compromise voice for gun owners. Stay tuned for valuable information on protecting your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And now, your host for GeorgiaCarry.org radio, Doug and Jesse King. Welcome, everybody. You're listening to GeorgiaCarry.org radio, and this week is one of our most exciting weeks. We've had some great guests on, and you know this show is not always about guests. We're going to have you know some more detailed discussion in the future. But we've we've been since our inaugural show, we've had just this incredible opportunity to have so many people from the board, you know, expert trainers, people who really are in the field to come and talk to you. And we're working on right now setting up an interview with a, a um, field editor for American Handgunner. More some of the th- board members. More board members maybe even madman james camp we'll get Woo-hoo. him in here soon so you know I hope this, he brings that baby with him i do too i want to yeah. hold that baby <laughs> <laughs> so here we are you know and it's been it's been kind of a, a fun ride but today it's going to get really serious because we have for the first time on our show a legislator somebody who uh, has gotten a lot of attention from this show recently because he has been uh promulgating a bill which georgia Kerry is not terribly fond of because it requires mandatory training and so we will have mr dexter sharper on in the next segment uh he is calling us in from the capitol building he's going to be on his cell phone so we are hoping that we don't have any technical difficulties uh, especially with sound quality but you know being that he's still wrapping up the legislative session as the time of this recording um and this is the only opportunity we're going to have to speak to him right now we we jumped at it and took as much time as we could with him um that he was able to give us today so in the next segment we're going to hear from him about his bill now this bill is a very interesting bill and we have talked about a little bit in the past but it involves two main principles first is that it requires mandatory training so you're going to have to get training and if you don't get training there is a fine attached to it as i read the bill it was 125 dollars fine for not completing training the second thing that the bill does is that um it, it is all in the name of safety and this is his you know, over overarch- platform for it overarching reasoning behind promulgating this mandatory training is that it's safety 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 now mr sharper is a relatively new legislator he is from valdosta and valdosta is a place near and dear to my heart along with mr james rancorn we went down there a couple weeks ago enjoyed their local luncheon and, and james told me that they had reached out to dexter sharper but because of the legislative session he wasn't able to come um, Jerry Henry's talked about Mr. Sharper as being the gentleman who went and didn't want to be the only person without a gun in the legislature, so bought one and doesn't know how to use it. So maybe we'll get a little bit more information about, you know, whether that's, you know, apocryphal or, or the, the truth of the matter. But, you know, we would hope that Mr. Sharper would have had training on his own, you know, before he got to this point and has decided that training is good because he's, you know, in, been involved in it and engaged with it. And that's why he's putting forth this idea of having mandatory training because the training did him so, so much good that he wants everybody to have it. Now, of course, Jesse, I think that mandatory training is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. I believe that mandatory training is one of the worst ideas I can have. Have you ever set in a, a mandatory training class for anything, such as orientation at a new job? Yeah, well, Nobody's I, paying attention. They're all picking at their fingernails, drawing pictures on the paper in front of them, texting. At, at least with the new job, it's something that you know you're you're... At, you're getting paid for being there. You're a little bit excited about the new job, and so it's it's mitigated. I when I was first starting doing DUI practice, and I, I think most people know that I'm a practicing attorney in North Georgia, and I handle DUIs and NFA trusts and things like that for the community. But uh, when I first started into it, I I had this reservation about sending my clients to DUI school or sending them to an AA meeting without knowing what it was like. So I went to an AA meeting and I got in good with one of the guys who's teaching a DUI class and I went to his class and I watched the people who were taking this DUI school. Now these are people who are being forced to go in the, under the penalty of fines or never getting their driver's license back. So these are people who are like being forced to take training under the penalty of fines or not fines, getting their license. To- or tolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here we have a very similar situation and they were angry they were bitter about being there they were pointedly not going to learn what was being taught because they hated having to be there and that's the kind of situation that we are in when we have mandatory training 
and I think that that's just sad. The the training that goes along with firearms ownership, learning how to properly maintain your gun, learning use of force, is a wondrous thing. This is fun. Learning how to shoot and move, learning how to be more proficient, learning the history of firearms. These are things that, that people who want to carry get excited about. And are we going to turn it down to being a day at the DMV? It It would feel like a day at the DMV. And I, I hate that concept. Notice I said DMV, not DDS. So I'm not picking on any Georgia agency or, or um, department. No. Huh. Anyway. Um, oh, well. So, you know, this is something that we can do and we can learn. And it's, learning is a good thing. And safety is a good thing. But is, I'm is, all about having training classes available because I grew up with rifles. And handguns, I'm not as educated with and i'm trying and i'm learning and i'm learning a lot from my husband lucky i have you know nra instructor living in the house with me but there's also some differences in what i would learn from say a female instructor and what mm-hmm. i would learn from you yeah that's true and so i think that the training being available i'm actually going to start doing some training myself going to some training classes but um Having that training available is is great. Well, and every I think instructor if, if has they, a different style too. Well, I believe if they want you, yeah, I agree. But if if they feel so strongly about everyone having training, then why don't they give us say a discount on our weapons carry license rather than a fine for not going to training? See, I, mean, I think that's brilliant right there. And and you know, there's so many different structor, instructors in different courses. You know, I, some people may not feel comfortable going and getting instruction from a police officer. You know, if they would offer the a tax deduction on your state taxes for taking a weapons training course, people that didn't even have a weapons carry license would take it. And then the whole state would be trained, and people would know what to tell their kids about yeah. a firearm. You know, that's that's actually brilliant. I... I was going to suggest just if you have taken a training course that you could take your certificate in and be able to get your Georgia weapons license absolutely free. That's not a bad idea either. But There's many my, other ways my idea done. only covers people who are going after licenses, whereas your idea covers anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like you know taking the defensive driving course and getting a few points off of your your insurance it makes sense to do it that way yeah no so th- there's a lot of opportunities here for great ways to get people involved in training and training that they need without making it a government mandate without forcing people to and without having using the the criminal process because if you're imposing a fine you're making a crime right right so that's a scary concept and i want to see fewer crimes and in fact i was having a discussion with another attorney just this last week when i was in court and he told me that you know what he thought should happen is every time that they enact a new law they should have to repeal two and if they did that then think about how many fewer laws we would have and just in the course of a couple of years we would be knocking out and of course you know the first legislative session they did it they'd be getting rid of the laws about you know carrying your pistol on horseback or not having a pig on main street but eventually we'd get to the meat and potatoes and what laws are really influencing people's lives every day and it would have to be tough choices made and i think, I think that- it would take a long time to actually get to the meat and potatoes because there's a lot of baloney laws in georgia that don't even need to exist well, there's 50 adult novelty store laws, and you you know what I'm talking there's about. There's 53 chapters of Georgia Code, and they each and one 52 of the 52 of them need to be done away with, probably. <laughs> well, you know what Jerry Henry always says is he wants you to open the book on Georgia gun laws and just be a blank page. And I think that that's really, I mean, Alaska was like that. You there were there were only two or three laws about the carrying or discharging of firearms in Alaska. Their laws are broader than federal law. Did you know that? Yeah. They you in Alaska as a convicted felon, you can carry a rifle around. Just not a handgun. Handgun. Yeah. And I understand that because it's hard to conceal a rifle. I mean, it, it's hard to put you know a shotgun down your pants. <laughs> well, you know there there are people who have concealed rifles, especially short barrel rifles under suit coats. But we're mm-hmm. we're not talking about me today. Our our d- own Doug King likes to try to conceal a desert, desert eagle under his try, Hawaiian shirt. Try. Try. You're, you're successful at it. It's scary. Thank you. It's like it's a household game in the King house. 
Well, guess, guess where the gun is? Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, we are coming back up on our uh, our com- we are coming up on our commercial break. When we come back, we will have Mr. Sharper on the phone. With any luck, we're going to discuss his bill with him in the the respectful manner that Georgia Kerry is known for, left, right, and center. And so, stay tuned for an exciting interview with a legislator who is in session today as we talk about mandatory training, good or bad in Georgia. You're listening to GeorgiaCarry.org Radio. We will be right back. Now, back to GeorgiaCarry.org Radio with Doug and Jesse King. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to GeorgiaCarry.org Radio, and this week we have a very special guest joining us by phone, Mr. Dexter Sharper, who is a Democrat from Valdosta. He serves the good people of District 177 well, and he's been in the legislature here in Georgia for almost two years now and has introduced a, a variety well, of bills. over two years. He came in in January of 2013, I think. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And he's been serving his constituents well down there in South Georgia, and he introduced a bill this last legislative session about um, training, and this caught our attention, and we really wanted to have him on the show, and he graciously agreed to come on. So, Mr. Sharper, thank you for coming on this day. Oh, thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your your bill about uh, training for people who have Georgia weapons carry licenses. Okay, um, the biggest thing is, um, some people may not know my history, but I'm also a Georgia paramedic. I've been a paramedic for 24 years now. And, you know, sometimes we see a lot of different things happen uh, with guns, especially accidental. And, you know, that's one thing that's kind of dear to me, to do everything we can in order to make sure everybody that's actually carrying a weapon, uh, you know, properly stored or, you know, uh, have it if it's concealed or open, whatever they have, to have as much training as they possibly can uh, for their safety and also the safety of others. And and safety and training are laudable goals, which we've been talking about here. I don't know if you've ever caught our show before, but the last couple shows we've been focusing on safety and training, especially training for, for children so that they know what to do if they ever, ever find a gun. So this is a very interesting topic for us. And you said that you want to make sure that everyone who carries a gun is as well trained as they can be. So what sort of training is mandated in your bill? Okay, well, all it would be is something under the direction of the local uh, law enforcement, um, it be the city or the county, uh, to have something as simple as we're not talking about going to the range, shooting, that type thing. We're talking about awareness, one, for uh, gun safety, and then we're talking about you probably knowing uh, how to actually clean your weapon, um, you know, understanding safeties and not safeties and Understanding when you actually supposed to possibly use your, um, your, your, your weapon. And, you know, cause you don't use it for anything that you feel you're threatened in. Some things, you know, you gotta use talking, you gotta use, uh, conflict resolution. There's a whole lot of things you need to do before you actually say, hey, look, I have a gun and I'm gonna shoot it because I even feel threatened or I think this is what I need to do because I have it. And, and that's um, that's typically called the use of force continuum, and that is something that is is very important that every gun owner should be aware of, of course. Right, right. And and the luck, and and, and I didn't know it, but uh, probably about two weeks ago, uh, on the south end of my county, uh, they actually offered a uh, free class to the seniors in the area um, for training, and I think that was nice, and not just for the ones that are you know build or carry, but actually the people that just have guns in general, and they were able to bring their own weapons uh, in order to harm, and they were able to look at them and go through them and get familiar with them, also learn how to clean, clean them, all them, things like that, and, you know, just overall, not just your safety, but the safety of others, on how to store them at home, you know, all those type things. I think that was great, so I'm going to be getting with um, them and seeing exactly how long that class was, how helpful it was, and hopefully they did some type of survey so I can get the information passed along. Yeah, that that's, sounds like a great class and something that would give you a lot of information about how people respond to a voluntary class where they are interested in it and can go and learn about their subject matter. Let me ask you this. Your bill, okay. you said that it's it's uh, set up so that local law enforcement will be offering these classes. Does your bill allocate funds for local law enforcement to be able to maintain these classes or to offer them? 
Uh, no, it doesn't because, for one, I think within what taxpayers pay anyway, and also by maybe being, uh, you know, in-house, they can use the uh, facility already owned by the county. Uh, we would just be looking at uh, the man hours in which if you just have, you know, one officer that's already doing some special training, that would be willing to come in, you know, uh, once, once a quarter. And if it's it less than four hours, I think, you know, we're not talking, about, you know, a whole lot of money. I think if we're looking at maybe $100 uh, per class um, to take care of you, any little small materials and payroll, uh, the class, if the class is less than four hours, I think, you know, $400 or so or $300 a year, it is worth investing into your community to save one life. Absolutely. And let me let me ask you this then. So you think that, you know, one class every quarter, so every three months in a particular... Well, well actually, right, let's just say that it would be offered, but the first one, they have to just go one class. They don't have to go, you know, one class every quarter, but we just can't let them offer it uh, every quarter so that'll make sure everybody has the opportunity you know, to take the class. And you think that there, with the number of people applying for permits, that that one class would be sufficient to cover everyone who needed it? Yeah, I would, I would think so, because, you know, you got to think about the peace officers and veterans and people that already have jobs where they have been uh, obligated to put some type of uh, weapons training. Uh, they would be exempt, so we wouldn't bother them at all about taking that class if we already know that they're trained. Okay, does that exemption cover anyone who has had any form of training? So that if, you know, you have an NRA certificate or something from Georgia Carey or something from another state, that that would co- cover it and, and exempt you? Yeah, I mean, we will be, oh, I will be very much open to that, you know, because, like, if we're in, look, taking suggestions still about this and, you know, hopefully moving it forward next session. That's why, you know, I dropped the bill um, this particular session, but I'm going to use the off season, the summer and all that to get more input to see where we can take it, you know, take the field. So, you know, I'm looking for a solution. It's not all about what's in the deal at this present time. Of course. It's about everybody getting involved, you guys, you know, just everybody. So we can make something that can, you know, that's feasible and and agreeable to everybody so we can save, you know, lives. Yes, yes, no, I... I, I agree wholeheartedly that that's an important aspect. Let me ask you one more quick question. Um, I know that okay. Jesse is, is chomping at the bit here, but I, I saw that your bill has a fine if you don't get this course within a certain number of days. Is, is that correct? Was I reading that right? Right. Uh, I don't have the bill right in front of me, but I think it's only like a $25 fine if you don't get it. And, and actually, it's, I mean, you would have a long time to get it done, and you know, you should have about a certain time, but if it's not done at that certain time, they're not going to come and rip your, you know, uh, your permit away from you. And you will, by the time you get ready to renew again, is when it's going to be a situation for you. That's when you would have the fine, or you know, they say, well, we may not renew it, but at least you still have the opportunity to get the class done. They won't renew it without you having that uh, class. So you need that $25 fine, and then you're going to have to really go ahead and get the class. Uh, okay, Jesse, did, did you have a couple of questions? I did. Uh, Mr. Sharper, okay. I was wondering, you know, a lot of the accidents that ham- happen with firearms are because of children who've never been around firearms and their parents know nothing about firearms accidentally getting a hold of one, as we've seen in Target, mm-hmm. Walmart, people leaving yeah. a gun lay. And, and typically that's not your concealed weapons carry people. That is somebody that wasn't supposed to have a gun in the first place that laid it down in the Walmart. Why don't we do this training when they're children? Because, well, I, you you know, the NRA offers a, a program. Eddie the Eagle. Eddie Eagle. And it is about um, what, what to do if you find a gun, even if it looks like a toy gun. Mm-hmm. What does a child do? And, and these children, a lot of families in the United States don't have guns, so those kids really don't know. And if it was in the schools, if our sheriff's departments were going into schools and saying, kids, this is what you do if you find a, go- a gun. You don't touch it. You go get a grown-up. These are the things you're supposed to do. That would stop some of this behavior where these kids are accidentally getting a gun and shooting another kid. And, and I'm sure with your history as being a paramedic, you've seen far too many of those kinds of incidents. Oh, yeah, and not only that, um, you know, in which, you know, that's something that we can address you know, in the future with, um, you know, the Board of Education 
and the police department to partner up because you have a lot of uh, resource officers in schools now, especially middle school and high school. But we can get it to where these smaller kids, the elementary schools, that I, I could definitely talk to, you know, the police chief or sheriff. So we'd have to have a lot of people talking, you know, throughout the state for sure to get them to go into the elementary schools and, uh, you know, have a gun safety awareness training day or something like that. That would help. And another thing that I've seen is not only with the little small kids, but I've seen where teenagers, you know, got a hold of guns and actually committed suicide. You know, so that that's another thing we have to look at. We can't always think that even teenagers um, would know what to do or it's easy access for teenagers knowing their parents, you know, knowing the key is, you know, for guns and where the guns are located. So I think you, you bring a great point. And just overall gun safety as well. Mr. Sharper, you know, you, you say that you need a lot of voices around the state to start to get safety to be a priority. And I don't think that you could find a better partner than GeorgiaCarry.org through our radio show here and across the membership right. as people who get really involved in, in issues that concern them. And safety is Georgia Carry's number one priority. I mean, that is what we are all about, the safety of people on the streets, the safety of people in their homes. And so here we have right. an opportunity to partner up with you to start moving an agenda forward that would really be focused focused on real safety issues and safety measures. And so I, I encourage you to reach out to people on the board and the people of our membership and to get to know us and to, to work with us to push forward some safety where we can get into the schools and get into the local communities and make people safer, um, you know, maybe with or without having to, to find them for it. But we are coming up on our right. commercial break, sir. Thank you okay. so much for coming on, and we really appreciate your time. Well, I look forward to uh, spending time with you guys, getting to know you. Let's work together and make it happen. It's not about me. It's about the safety of the people, and I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me, and I, I know we can make something happen. Let's be proactive, and let's make it happen. Absolutely. Man, I'm all in. Thank Absolutely. you so much, we're, Mr. We're, we're just about to go to commercial break, but before we go, let me ask you, Mr. Sharper, have you had uh, a training course for, for your concealed carry weapon? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, that, know- once I get out of Once I get out of the... Uh, session here, and I'm looking forward to finding somewhere, because I, I really would like to learn how to honestly uh, disengage, well, basically take my gun apart and learn how to clean it. Sir, if you'll I, contact Georgia I, Carey, we have a lot of trained professionals who give the weapons training classes. More than that, I'm an NRA certified instructor, and I will offer you a class for free one-on-one, so we can help you get a little bit more yeah. proficient. So I'll be in touch with you later. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, right. sir, and we'll be right back. Now, back to GeorgiaCarry.org radio with Doug and Jesse King. Welcome back, everybody. What an interview. I mean, that was really some exciting stuff out of Mr. Sharper. And I, I'm some of the things he said made some, some good sense, and some of the things he said just blew me away, Jesse. You know what blew me away? What? Is that he hasn't even had a training course, but he's trying to make us do it. That is kind of shocking. Asinine. Well, no, no, no. It's shocking. I, I think that, that he is well-meaning, and he is trying hard to serve his constituents. Well, I'm but, sure you've heard the old adage that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Well, he, he needs to have a training course so he knows what he's getting people into. And that's why I volunteered right, off the, right, right out of the gate when I heard that. I know you said we've got great instructors, and GeorgiaCarry.org does certify fantastic instructors. They are wonderful people who are committed and believe in firearms ownership and want people to be safe and want people to be enthusiastic, and it is a great program. But I'm not going to wait for him to go find somebody to teach him about his gun. I I will drive to Valdosta, and I will give him a half-day course on everything he needs to know about his gun and teach him how to use it and be proficient with it and talk about the laws that I know as an attorney and the way things work in Georgia. And I think that if he is better educated, we would get a lot better bills out of this gentleman about what the carrying and use of firearms are. The, the man is a paramedic. He has worked years, and he has seen the damaging effects of people being shot, and that has an effect on people. Far too few people who carry guns have seen gunshot wounds, have have dealt with that trauma, and I think that it would be good if every person who carried a gun took the time to go and investigate what gunshot wounds and trauma are really like in the real world. And we, we're going to fall back to Matthew Potowitz, who was mm-hmm. on the show, and he said one of the best places you can look at that kind of trauma and what kind of damage bullets can do is Mythbusters, of yeah. all things. So I was watching Mythbusters the other day with 
John, which is Doug's son. And we were watching what some bullets can do. They were firing into that ballistics gel. John was like, holy moly, look at that. And it was, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's big time for such a small thing. It's big time. Yeah. So, I mean, that's an important thing. And I can understand where Mr. Sharper is coming from. We want people to be safer. We don't want to have accidental shootings. We want people to be well informed of where they can carry, when they can carry, why they should carry, what they can do when they carry, when they can't uh, you know, exercise deadly force, when they should, and what the consequences all of it all. This is all good stuff. The problem is, is trying to force people to do something something versus encouraging them to do something. And in our first segment, Jesse, you were talking about tax breaks. I was talking about reducing fees on licenses. Instead, Mr. Sharper is talking. He said it was a $25 fee. It's I, 125 I believe, in the bill. I believe in the bill it was $125. i am not going to contradict the man. I mean, it is his bill, and I'm sure he knows it backwards and forwards. He said he didn't have it in front of him. And, of course, you know, we have a lot of bills coming in and out of the legislature and the final week after crossover. But still, I, I'll take him at his word that it was a $25 fee fine but i don't care if it was a 50 cent fine if you're being fined you're making it criminal and i don't want more criminal law in georgia i i've got enough work to do rather than making new laws that are going to make it even harder for people to exercise fundamental rights for them to be safe in their communities right right so here we have a a gentleman who is very well intentioned and, and we appreciate him and one of the things that stuck out to me from the interview jess was when he said that he wants to have voices all around the state my goodness if you're looking for voices all around the state we're it when it comes to safety when it comes to gun issues where else are you going to find voices around the state like georgiacarry.org right you're not going to get this big of a group of people of to have that many voices in any other organization that i'm aware of of course and so here you know he says well we need voices around the state we're it and we're going to push for things that are meaningful and real and, and, and that will help people. But we're not going to push for fines. We're not going to push for mandatory training on people when they don't need it. Now, something else he said that I thought was interesting was that he's willing to exempt the government from these requirements, but not necessarily the people. You know what bothers me? Every politician that comes up with something that you're going to get fined if you don't have wants to exclude their family and friends from it while leaving the public to suffer the consequences. Like this gun training bill, he's like, well, you know, the, the police could be exempt from it. And, I don't and military. Know. I think I believe that some of our local police officers may need a little bit more training about when it's appropriate to use that firearm when it's not. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But, you know, here's the thing. When we said, well, what about if you have training then? Let's say you've taken an NRA course or a Utah carry course or the course that's required in Pennsylvania or Florida or one of these other states. What if you've taken, you know, an NRA first steps program? What if you took Mr. Potowitz's program? Can you be exempt? then does anyone who's had training get exempted from this and he's like well we can consider that consider so if you've had training you may have to retake your training to make even if you gradu- this bill. you graduated from gun sight with honors you still may have to go back and take this kindergarten class about how to clean your gun and see that's the reason that this gun training is not one house fits all and that's what they're failing to understand is we've got a novice such as me Mm-hmm. and a master such as Doug King, and we're both sitting here at the same time side by side. We have vast differences in the kind of training we would need. In fact, the training I would need is what Doug King could teach me. So for you to go into my gun training class, the kind of class I would need would be like sending Picasso to a kindergarten art class and making him trace his hand with chalk. Well, you're you're very kind, but the 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 end of this is is that it just doesn't fit, and that's not right. And people shouldn't be made to go take training that doesn't fit their needs. And you know, the other thing that he was talking about that was honestly a little scary in all of this is the number of classes. Um, Mr. Sharper, as well-intentioned as he is and as much respect I have for him, has absolutely no concept of the number of Georgians who are carrying firearms every day to protect themselves and their families. Well, when he's talking about one class had to be offered every quarter, a quarter. he's going to end up with five or 600 people trying to take one class every quarter. And what happens if you're... Especially in big counties, Fulton County. Can you imagine in Fulton or DeKalb, the bigger counties with with higher populations... Even Henry County down south is is a pretty large area. How many people in a month's time apply for a weapons permit? Well, even even in the rural counties where you have multiple counties being dealt with with one agency, you know, you've. 
because you got like like you go up to where my friend is a DA, he's got four counties underneath his belt. So you got all those people gathered together, and then they're all going to show up. What what are you going to do when you've got? And especially you're thinking about everyone who's applying for this license over a three month period. So you've got everybody in the county trying to get this done. And what if you're not available the day they choose to, to offer it? What if you had a medical emergency? What if you had a, a death in the family? What if you had work and it was a choice between going to work or losing your job? You get fined. Now, who hears this case? I don't know. I don't know how it's set up, but it if would it, probably be in front of, you know, a, in a small county, a probate court judge who would handle municipal fines or, or if in a larger county, a state court or maybe even superior court. Like I don't drop their own funds. That's the money making for that county. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's imposing a tax on people criminally in a way that if you can't comply, you're going to get into serious trouble. And he says, well, they wouldn't come and take your license away. But And I hate to make slippery slope It's criminalizing arguments. behavior that's not criminal. Uh, exactly. It really is. So I, I think the bill, as it sits right now, is, is very dangerous ground. But it could be a good bill. It could be. If we took away the mandatory part of the training and made it voluntary, if we made it so that you could get a tax break or you could get a free license for taking training, if we said that that we're going to make sure that every Georgian knows how to safely handle a gun by teaching it in elementary school, middle school, and high school. That would would, be a good training. That that, would be a training bill. That's not what they're after, though. They want to fine, 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 fine. Well, I think Mr. Sharper... Based on his willingness to come on this show, his wanting to reach out to have voices around the state to advance a safety agenda is a perfect candidate for people from around this state to reach out to over the he said he's going to work on the bill right right he's willing he said that he's going to work over the summer mm-hmm. use the, the bill to work on during so the off session what we can do here is if you're interested in in giving Mr. Sharper some output on the bill, you can reach him by mail. At 19 Sharper Circle, Valdosta, Georgia, 31601. Or you can call his office. The number is 404-656-0126 and tell him you're a constituent and you don't think mandatory training with a fine is the right course of action. If you're not in District 177, you're not actually his constituent directly, call him and tell him that you're one of the voices from around the state that he reached out to on georgiacarry.org radio and that you would like to see his bill amended in these ways to make it so that it's not a, a new crime, that it is not forcing people to, into one-size-fits-all training, but that it opens up the doors, that it creates a a way for people to be involved and, and, and save them money and encourage people to be, to be responsible. Instead of creating a criminal offense for it, we need to create a culture of education for it. Absolutely. And that's, that should be everyone's goal. And that would be something that we could work towards and with Mr. Sharper on. You know, we talk about having bipartisan support of bills and getting people, whether they're left, right, or center, if they're pro-gun, then they're pro-us. Well, this is a good opportunity. Mr. Sharper seems to be someone who's willing to listen. And if he's not, then, you know, there's, there's always consequences to those actions of not listening to your constituents. But he seems to be someone who really does want to do what's good for everybody. And I believe that his heart is in the right place i think that he he really is concerned about safety but safety starts with with the children i believe you see more children involved in shootings where a child accidentally found a gun and the parents didn't even know where the gun was parents didn't know the gun was there it was at walmart it was at target it was in the park it was in the children's hospital in in a nondescript city of a nondescript state yeah the point is those children find the guns and they're not educated because there's so many people that don't have firearms. That training, that mandatory training, should be mandatory for the schools to offer it. Yeah, Man- I, mandatory for children to understand what to do if they find a firearm. Not to touch it, even if it looks like a toy gun. Because some real guns really look like toy guns. I saw one at the last uh, chapter meeting we were at, one of where the ladies was carrying it. It's pink. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, man, how much that thing looks like a toy? Well, folks, we are right up against another commercial break. When we come back, we're going to have the good, the bad, and the ugly ways that you can get involved and reach out into your community. So stay tuned. Uh, We hope that you're enjoying the show. We will be right back. And now, back to GeorgiaCarry.org radio with Doug and Jesse King. 
Welcome back, everybody. You've been listening to GeorgiaCarry.org radio this hour, and we're into our final segment. And we wanted to, to remind you all that if you're not a member of GeorgiaCarry.org, it, it is the best gun organization in all of the state. They have done some fantastic things, passing bills that have made our safer and more effective. It is the largest voice in the states for guns rights. And when legislators say we need voices around the state, where they're going to have to turn to to get anything done, it's going to be GeorgiaCarry.org. And we would invite you to join the the organization with a, a simple monitor donation of $20 for a year. I mean, it's, it's an easy way to get involved, start getting the newsletters, start to find out what's happening in your area. You can get involved in the local chapters, and you can join at the GeorgiaCarry.org website, as well as just about any gun show and most of the festivals around the state. And and this is something that is really upcoming and, and important to the festivals. I mean, Georgia Carry is uh, sponsoring one of the bigger festivals. Isn't that right, Jesse? I believe so. What the was big, the big shanty, shanty festival? festival. Yeah, is a is a GeorgiaCarry.org is a sponsor. Their name is going to be emblazoned on all of the the t shirts of the the workers there and on the banners. It's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, that's a funny story behind the big shanty festival. Have you heard this story? No, tell me. Apparently, we were told that we weren't going to be allowed to carry our guns to the big shanty festival, and now all of a sudden we're the main sponsor of the big shanty festival. Somehow that got turned around. Well, you know, that's really the genius of GeorgiaCarry.org. Instead of getting angry, instead of making a fuss, GeorgiaCarry.org takes the upper road and turns the situation around for the advantage of everybody who believes in freedom. You've got to be grateful for that, somebody to have your back. Yes, exactly. So, you know, go ahead and join up, uh, get, get involved, start volunteering at a gun show or in your local community. Keep your eye peeled for ordinances that are, are improper. That's one of the... GeorgiaCarry.org's main focus is, is going you know, city by city and making sure that their ordinances are in compliance with state law. Even you know, our friend James Camp who found one just a few weeks ago and started a, a letter of, of intent and who knows, maybe a lawsuit if they won't remove it. These are very important things. So, And the other thing you can do is if you're listening to this show on a podcast or on a website instead of listening to it live on the air somewhere, call your local station. Put them in touch with us at radio at GeorgiaCarry.org. Let them know that they can get this show on air for you where you can listen to it every week without having to use up all of your data on your Verizon phone or wherever else you're trying to download it to. So this is a good opportunity. Let us know which stations you're reaching out to as well at radio at georgiacarry.org and we'll follow up with them to make sure that we're on the station nearest you. So, Jesse, with that little bit of introduction, what is the good, the bad, and the ugly this week? Yeah, I'm really excited about the good this week. Yeah, it's a local story. Um, apparently, on the 26th of March, a gentleman was standing in the Wells Fargo Bank in Marietta. Now, as I recall, Wells Fargo has the no gun sign on their door. They do, and he did not take his firearm into the bank. This is incredible, this story. But his name is Mark Ketchum, which is an awesome name for the story, Ketchum. Mm-hmm. And someone attempted to rob the bank. And he went to his car, and he got his firearm, and he stopped them. Wow. And so the, he was a customer that was inside, and he noticed what was going on. He followed the crook out the door. He ran to his car and grabbed his gun. And then, he, oh, no, the criminal is Ketchum. The um, customer's unnamed in the article. But the criminal was ordered by the guy to get down on the ground, and he held him there until police arrived. So wow. not only did he not get the loot, but he also probably is looking at some jail time. Well, that's that's an impressive story. You know, and that's something that has come up before. When Back when I was in law school, I did a report about a shooting that happened at a law school. I believe it was the University of Virginia. I might be mistaken, but there was a law school somewhere in that kind of continental or coastal area on, on the East Coast where a gunman had gone and shot the dean of students and his secretary and was coming down an elevator. And it was illegal to carry a firearm in the school. So one of the the gentlemen who went to that school, and of course you know, law school students are, are a little bit older than regular college students, allegedly, and this I've always wondered about the physicality of this, but allegedly when he saw what, heard the gunshots and saw what was happening, he ran outside the building into the parking deck, up to the parking garage, got his firearm out of his car, ran back down to the ground floor, back into the law school building, over to where the elevator was, and when the elevator doors opened, he was able to shoot the gunman and kill him. He's either Superman or he already, already had the gun on him. I'm well, just saying. if he had already had the gun on him, that would have been a crime. Well, we're... So... 
it was really an impressive feat, and he was able to prevent a lot of law school students from being injured or killed that day, and it was it was a good thing. So, you know, these are great stories. So there, there's the good, and it is a very good story. What's the bad this week? The bad, I've, I've actually pulled the bad off of the Georgia Carey um, North Atlanta groups. A page. great group. They had a wonderful meeting last week, and we enjoyed being there and seeing John Monroe and Tim Parker and and Mark Gilbert and and Stephen Malice and all the good people in the North Georgia Cap chapter. So I was sitting there the other day, and I made a couple of comments on this about how our government is out of control when this can happen. There's a gentleman in Athens, Georgia, I believe. His name's Andrew Clyde, and he's a gun owner and he's a gun store owner, and he had insurance on his money to where if if he was robbed for over ten thousand dollars the insurance wouldn't cover it so he started doing his deposits in increments of less than ten thousand dollars to protect his money and i don't blame him um his bank reported him because the law states that transactions in excess of ten grand are supposed to be reported to the feds however they were reporting his multiple transactions under 10 grand and the federal government came in and seized $950,000 of this gentleman's property. And in order to make this go away, he ended up forfeiting 50 grand of his money. That's just terrible. (laughs) It it was terrible. This isn't the good, the bad and the ugly. This is the good, the terrible and the ugly. Yeah. Because uh, Doug King has the story to the ugly and it is not about seeing Rosie O'Donnell in her swimsuit. Yeah, yeah. Well, the ugly this week comes from death and taxes mag.com, where we learned that um, tragedies with firearms can take many different shapes when people don't have proper training, shall we say. Um, there was a story out of Trinidad about a security guard who accidentally um, shot himself in the groin. So he shot his manhood off. Pretty much, clean. Yikes. And so this got a lot of attention, but apparently this is not, nothing new because in the past three years there have been five such incidents right here in the U.S., and they listed them. Back in September of 2012, Michael Smurglio, while cleaning his pistol, managed to shoot himself in the groin. In July of 2012, Taylor's Gil Colbert was testing out a firearm and apparently did not know that don't point at anything that you're not willing to destroy when he accidentally destroyed something rather important to him. In, <laughs> in August 2011, Joshua Sito was walking into a store with his girlfriend, apparently carrying his pistol with the muzzle pointed in an unsafe place with no safety on when it went off and made her a very sad young lady. Now he's the girlfriend. <laughs> In May of 2010, an unidentified man was shopping at Lowe's. A lone shopper blew away his own genitalia on a Sunday afternoon while walking the aisles at Lowe's Home Improvement in Washington State. The gun was kept not so safely in his waistband. And finally, we have March of 2010, an unidentified teenager walking into a medical center. This one was pretty shocking. A 17-year-old in Vallejo, California, was spotted holding his wounded crotch while walking into the emergency room. At the time of the report, the kid didn't tell anyone what had happened. So there's five ugly stories of men who were not being safe and managed to injure themselves i have a question about the last one did he do that in the parking lot of the hospital or was that i have i have no more information than that but the fact that it was a 17 year old so you've got here you have a minor under georgia law not allowed to own a firearm but allowed to use one under supervision and i've seen so many of these things i mean there was an episode that doesn't sound like he was even using it under under supervision it sounds like mom and dad wasn't home he started to play with the gun, and oops. I wonder we, if he drove himself to the hospital. We have no idea. But I remember seeing an episode of Doomsday Preppers where this guy who was going to be the most prepped person out there and ready for anything managed to shoot his own thumb off with a Ruger ten twenty two rifle, who immediately went into shock and was saved by the cameraman. So there are some people <laughs> some out there. Some things you just can't be prepared for. Yeah, there are some people out there that, that are truly scary human beings, and there's some ugly stories. And today's Darwin Award goes to? Well, you know, <laughs> at least where they, I, I'm assuming all of those five people and the sixth one in Trinidad survived, at least they won't be causing any more trouble with their progeny. Um, but you know, here we are. <laughs> 
Coming up to the end of People the show. People like that don't need to reproduce. I'm just saying. We're, we're just about at the end of the show, and, and I want to thank everyone for listening in. I think that, that our guest today was an incredibly interesting guest to hear from to get his perspective on why he's trying to force mandatory training on all of the people in Georgia who carry a firearm, but not the people who may encounter a firearm. And I think that this is someone we can reach out to and, and help sway his opinion on what is the best course of action in Georgia. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be here next week with another exciting guest we're hoping maybe someone from the board if we can get one of them to to agree to call in and and endure our ridicule but we will be back next week you are listening to georgiacarry.org radio the voice of georgia carry right here on your local station this has been georgiacarry.org radio with doug and jesse king georgiacarry.org is georgia's no compromise voice for gun owners Tune in each week for valuable information on protecting your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms.